Jesus is excited about you. Amen? He's excited about you. He's looking for the opportunity to bless your lives, that the blessing of God would overtake you. Amen? Can you imagine you're running so fast to try to get away because you can't handle so much blessing, but it just tackles you anyway? Amen? That's living the high life, folks. Amen. Deuteronomy 28. He wants to overtake you with blessing. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you now in the matchless name of Jesus. We thank you here even as we're in your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you are magnified and you are glorified here today. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here today. We welcome your anointing here today. For it's the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. Lord, we thank you for your anointing is upon the word. For you said in your word, your word is spirit and your word is life. And that life cancels out all death. Death in our understanding. Death in our thinking. Death even at work in our mortal bodies. Lord, I even thank you, Lord, that the word comes forth today with clarity. That Holy Spirit, you're the teacher of the word. And that the word would become engrafted upon their hearts and their minds. Holy Spirit, give your people the revelation and the illumination of the word. That they would be able to line themselves up to the standard that you said we should live in. Satan, we take great delight in reminding you that you are a defeated foe. That you've been rendered powerless and you have no authority to come against this day or this teaching. So we rebuke you, you lying devil. And we tell you, you have no place. Now, Lord, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. This morning, we're going into part four of learning from the life of Daniel. How many were here for part one? How many were here for part two? How many were here for part three? How many are here for part four? Hopefully, that was unanimous. Amen. Learning from the life of Daniel, purity, diligence, and excellence. We've been talking on the theme of excellence. Daniel was a man of excellence. The Bible said he had an excellent spirit. Turn to your neighbor and say, excellent. Excellent. When we say the word excellent, we hear the word excel. Right? Because the word excellent means to rise above the rest. Turn to your neighbor and say, sounds like you. Now, before I go into reading the word this morning, you know, we live in a society that uses words very loosely. We use words without understanding the intent of their meaning. You know, when Sherlock Bailey was here a couple years back, you know, he talked about using the word awesome. And awesome has become such a part of our vocabulary that it's used for everything. Oh, man, that cheeseburger was awesome. You know, the same thing holds true with the word excellent or excellence. You know, especially back during, yo, man, most excellent, dude. Remember that whole period? (laughs) Everything was all about, everything is excellent, man. Look at your shoes, man. They're excellent, man. You know, and we come to this place where we take the meaning of excellence and we bring it down to this lower place where it doesn't really have the meaning intended. Amen? Amen. So bear that in mind as we go through this. In Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, in the New Living Translation. You there? You knew we would be talking in the book of Daniel, right? It says, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. And he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. That's 120 rulers, right? The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and to protect the king's interests. Verse 3, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. So understand, the king sets forth 120. But because Daniel was a man of excellence, it was noticeable. Whenever we live in excellence, you're going to stand out. You have no choice because the word excellent means to stand out. It means above the rest. Say above the rest. There's no room for mediocrity in excellence. Daniel had an excellent spirit, the word says. 
And because of that, he was promoted to one of the 120 over Babylon. Verse 3 in the New King James says, Then this Daniel became distinguished above the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. How many of you are looking for a raise? How many of you are looking for a promotion? Excellence. Having an excellent spirit. Now let me say something. When you first gave your life to Jesus, you might not have been so excellent. You might have been in the area of need or want or lacking. But as we grow, say grow. Grow. As we grow in our relationship with God, we get better and better and better and better. This excellence thing isn't something that we can just sometimes turn a light switch on and be totally perfect. How many perfect people do we have here? If you're perfect, please leave. You're a liar. (laughs) No one obtains perfection. Jesus is perfect. Amen? But we grow into these things. And if you're a young babe and you're a new believer, you know, this is something you grow into through your relationship with God. Amen? He brings us to that place. So Daniel and his friends, they were cut above everyone else in their skills, the Bible says, even in literature as well as wisdom. They were wise guys. Well, not those kind of wise guys. And not the three stooges kind of wise guys either. They were full of the wisdom of God. Sounds like you. The Bible says Jesus was made to be wisdom for us. And Jesus' word is wisdom for us. And we become people of the word of God. We begin to fill ourselves up with wisdom. Godly wisdom. Knowledge produces understanding. And the application of that understanding produces wisdom. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. So we need to get to the place where we are moving according to godly wisdom, not natural wisdom. This kind of wisdom has nothing to do with college degrees. This kind of wisdom has nothing to do with being intelligent. As a matter of fact, I come to find that the more simple a person is, the greater man or woman of God they become. Because they don't question everything. And they don't try to figure things out. And they don't put themselves in a place of maybe I'm a little bit smarter than God. Now they don't say it, but their thoughts reflect that. Well, the Lord said this, well, maybe I can figure out a better way, you know, instead of just being submitted to the word of God and doing it his way. Amen? That's wisdom to be a doer of the word. Can I get an amen? Amen. So they rose above the best. We read that Daniel and his friends were better than the rest. Amen? Sounds like you. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 20 in the Amplified Bible, It says, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king asked of them, he found them ten times better than all the learned magicians and enchanters who were in the whole realm. Daniel and his friends were ten times better. Say ten times better. Ten times better. He was ten times better than the smartest people in the kingdom. Which means he rose to the top. Him and his friends rose to the top. This used to be the smartest ones, but now Daniel and his friends became the smartest ones. They became the ones full of godly wisdom. Listen, to be able to interpret dreams and things like that, you know, it takes the wisdom and the insight from God. Can you get an amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Why? Why were they better? Well, first of all, God was for them. God was for them. God was on their side. Daniel knew his God. We talked last week that Daniel was a man of prayer. Ever since he was a young child, he was brought up in the tradition of knowing God, not just knowing about God. He was a man who prayed at least three times a day. He was a man who was acquainted with his God. And the Holy Spirit was around him and the Holy Spirit was upon him, but the Holy Spirit wasn't in him like the Holy Spirit is in you and 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 me. So if Daniel was 10 times better, how much more better should we be? 
Here's the answer, and it's a sad truth. Only as better as you want. Amen? Only as much as you want, because God never forces his will down our throats. Sometimes I wish he did. It would make my job so much easier. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't violate our will. We need to be willing to want God's all. We need to be willing to lay some stuff down that gets in the way. We talked last week that not only was he a man of prayer, but because he was a man of prayer, he wouldn't be defiled by the things of this world. He wasn't moved by the things of this world. He wasn't going to the nightclubs. He was going to prayer. Amen? He wasn't drinking alcohol. He wasn't getting drunk. He wasn't smoking crack. They probably had something similar to crack back then. <laughs> Might not have been called crack. Maybe it was called whack. I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there, but he wasn't doing it, so it doesn't matter. He separated himself. He was a man who was consecrated, set apart, and called for God's purposes, just like each and every one of us. Amen? How many of you have a calling? Amen. Every one of you have a calling. I thought only the pastors had a calling. Well, he called you out of darkness into light. You've been called. Hello? Just pick up the phone. He's been calling. Step up. Amen? So God was for them. And as believers, doesn't it say in Romans chapter 8 that God is for us? Right? God is for us. Who could be against us? If God is for you, who could be against you? Nobody can be against you. If the devil has been stripped of his power, according to the word of God, if Jesus went into the bowels of the earth, into hell, and took away the keys from Satan, keys represent authority, which is another word for power, Jesus stripped the devil of his power. If he doesn't have power to come against you directly, only to deceive you and lie, you, lie to you, then the only one that could ever come against us is us. When we stop believing... Or when we say, oh, wait a minute, that's getting a little fanatical. Oh, I'm good enough. I'm not as bad as I was. I'm not doing drugs anymore. I accepted Jesus in my heart. That's all I have to do. No, we're supposed to grow in grace and grow in knowledge of knowing who God is in your life. Amen? We are growing constantly. We are getting closer, pressing to the high calling, pressing to the high calling, not coasting there. Amen? I don't think you guys like me today. <laughs> right? Hebrews 8, 6 says, in fact, because now we're under a new and better covenant, we have better promises than Daniel. Amen? So what God was able to do through the life of Daniel should be a piece of cake for us. Through the Holy Spirit. Not through your own strength, not through your own ability, not through your own good looks, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. If anyone lacks wisdom, all they got to do is ask. I need wisdom. Reveal to me how to be 10 times, no, 20 times, no, 100 times better than the rest. For your kingdom, for your glory, not for my own. Because this isn't about propping up ourselves. This is about propping up the kingdom of God in the face of kingdom of darkness. Amen. Amen. A kingdom that won't be shaken, a kingdom that won't be broken, a kingdom that cannot be torn down. Amen. As much as the media would like to do it, as much as the world would like to do it, as much as your neighbors might want to try, or as much as even relatives might want to try, if you're standing firm in the knowledge of who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you, and you're pressing into the high call, they can't touch you. Amen? If we're striving for that place of being excellent in all we say and all we do, God will honor you. Amen? Right? So if God empowered Daniel and his friends to be excellent and high in understanding, he can definitely do it with us. Can you say amen? amen. We are called to confound the wise. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Are we learning anything yet? We're about to. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27. King James Version says this. Are you there? I'll wait for you to get there. 1 Corinthians 1. It 
But God has chosen. Stop. It wasn't your choice to come to Jesus. He chose you. Many are called, few are chosen. Turn to your neighbor and ask, called or chosen? Called or chosen? God had chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. Amen? Let's talk about the word foolish. Let's talk about foolish. The word foolish in the Greek is the word moros. Say moros. Moros, and that's the same Greek word where we get moron from. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am no longer a moron. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Have you ever met a moron? Moronic is what it means. It also means dull. You ever meet a person who's dull? Now, I'm not talking about boring. People who are dull in their understanding of spiritual things. Before you got saved, were you dull? It also means stupid. As if to be shut up. Right? In other words, ignorant. Before we got saved, we were ignorant of so many things. We were ignorant of the devices of the devil. We were ignorant of the goodness and the mercy of God. We were ignorant. We just didn't know better. We may have been religious and we went through the motions and we did all the signs and bowed and everything that went with our faith. But we were ignorant to the truth that we needed to know God on a personal level. Thank God you got saved. Hallelujah. Are you glad you got saved? Amen. The word moros also means heedless. Heedless. We didn't know that we needed to heed to the voice of God. We were heedless. Absurd. And morally, we were blockheads. That's what it says in the Greek. Don't, don't yell at me. We were moral blockheads. How many of you, before you came to Jesus, had little or no morals? Maybe you had high morals, and that's great, but today... It's becoming a rare commodity. We lie, we cheat, we scheme, we connive. We do anything to get ahead. Amen? It's the society we live in. The thing is, is God called us to be better. God called us to walk in excellence. God called you to change society. Amen. Daniel changed his whole country. God called you to change your country. Amen. God called you to change your city. God called you to change your block. So have a block party and have an altar call. Before you can give out the weenies, you got to accept Jesus. Well, maybe not. That's, that's cruel. Amen. But your love will draw them in. So the foolish things, the moronic things, the absurd things of this world would confound the wise. The word confound means to shame or to shame down, that is to disgrace, or by implication cause them to blush, embarrass them, disappoint them, dishonor them. What is God saying here? God is saying that we come from this place of being totally ignorant from the things of God and maybe even simple-minded people before we got saved that God would raise us up through his love, through his power, and becoming these people of excellence, that even the smartest people in this city will be blown away by your wisdom. Is that impossible? Is that something you want? Say, gimme, gimme, gimme. Amen? It's not good to be greedy unless you're talking about the things of God. It's okay to be greedy for the things he's freely given. Amen? Amen? Don't be greedy for your neighbor's wife. Because that goes to that moral blockhead situation. Amen? Hallelujah. I got a couple more definitions here. Can you handle them? Yeah. You sure now? Yeah. Okay. The Thayer says about this word moros. Dull, flat, mentally inert, nonsensical, lacking a grip on reality. 
You know, the world lacks the grip on spiritual reality. Refers to physically nerves, causing one to become dull, sluggish. Say sluggish. Sluggish. What's another word for sluggish? The Bible calls lazy people sluggards. So it means lazy. Stupid, foolish. Amen? The word confound means, I said it already, to cause disgrace. The voice translation of 1 Corinthians one twenty seven says, but celebrate this. God selected the world's foolish to bring shame upon those who think they're wise. He selected the world's weak to bring disgrace upon those who think they're strong. Amen? The way we as Christians shame the wise is not by being lazy, who don't do anything well or faithfully. In other words, the way we shame the wise is by living in excellence, by being diligent in all areas of our life, by not being lazy but being hard workers. You know, the American work ethic is sit back, relax. Oh, here comes the boss. Look busy. You don't get away with that stuff in the end. Because if God says he's going to judge you for every idle word, well, he'll also judge you for every idle action. So if we're slothful and if we're lazy, if we just get this mentality of I'll just get by mentality, we are living way below the level where we should. Now again, it's progression, it's growth, right? If you gave your life to Jesus yesterday, it's gonna be hard to start living 100% excellent tomorrow. That's why the word diligence exists, because it's a working at getting better. Amen. We shame the wise by being more wise. We shame the wise by having a greater anointing. We shame the wise by walking in more blessing. And we shame the wise by end up becoming more successful from them. Does successful mean rich in money and wealth? It could. But what about having a successful marriage? When your bosses and co-workers are on their third, fourth, and fifth. Right? Being a success in all areas. Raising children who are respectful of adults. Raising children who are respectful of authority. Who are respectful towards their teachers. Respectful towards the police. Respectful towards the pastor. You know, whatever. Respectful towards God. Having the fear and admiration of the Lord in their life. That's a success. If you can raise a child that doesn't go the way of the world. You're successful. Amen. 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 And God gives you a gold star for that. Amen. Hmm. We don't confound the wise by being negligent. We do it by being diligent. The point in the verse is not that we stay foolish. We don't stay fools. We don't stay in that place of being fools. We allow God to work in our lives. The point of the passage is that we once were fools, but God came in and he blessed us. Amen? Can you relate? I know I can relate. Stephen in the Bible was foolish before Christ, but after his conversion, no one could resist the wisdom and the spirit of his life. Stephen, he became so greatly and highly admired, well, he was the first martyr. They said, he's too wise, he got to go. Acts chapter 6 and verse 10 in the Amplified says this about him. But they were not able to successfully withstand and cope with the wisdom and the intelligence and the power and the inspiration of the spirit by whom he was speaking. You see, Stephen was a nobody until he got saved and he became not only a somebody, he became a somebody. Amen? Amen? That means there's hope for you. That means there's hope for you. That means there's hope for you. There's hope, and there's definitely hope for me. Amen? Because I haven't obtained and I haven't arrived. We're all in the same ship. Amen? Whew. How about Peter and John? Peter and John were arrested, and the religious leaders of the day thought they were nobodies, but realized that they were wrong 
because they had been with Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 in the Amplified says this, Now when they saw the boldness and unfettered eloquence of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and untrained in school, common men with no education, they marveled and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus, the word, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get your mind renewed into the mind of Christ. And I know the last time I checked, Jesus wasn't stupid. Jesus wasn't dull. Jesus wasn't a blockhead. But our mind gets renewed so we can actually put on the mind of Christ and think like Christ. He was made wisdom for us. Put the wisdom in. No wisdom in, no wisdom. You got to put it in. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Got to put it in. Amen. Peter and John were dumb, uneducated men. But they got saved and they dumbfounded people. Know what it means to be dumbfounded? It means to be found dumb. So shocked that there's no words to speak. I'm at a loss of words. You guys used to be filthy fishermen. You guys never went to school. You learned your trade through your family. You learned how to catch fish. What happened? Jesus, the word. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you aren't saved yet, then you could stay in your folly. But because you are saved, be like Daniel. Be excellent in all that you do. Amen? How do we do that? By becoming dependent upon the Holy Spirit. All the disciples and apostles did all the great things for the kingdom of God because they did it dependent upon the Holy Spirit. You can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own knowledge. You can't do it in your own wisdom. It has to be through the Spirit of God. Amen? And through the Spirit of God, we in turn can do all things through Christ Jesus. Amen? How many of you want this? Amen. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that we go out in human zeal, but we ought to ask God to help us to be excellent. And we ought to be more than 10 times better than those who don't know Jesus. Listen. Why would anybody want to become like you if you are not living in the fullness of God? Come to Jesus and you could be just like me. I'm sick, I'm poor, and I'm hopping on one foot. My wife hates me, my children don't speak to me, but come and you could be just like me. <laughs> know what they say? You crazy, Jack. Be like you? No, be like Daniel. Really? I said last week, when you're really being like Daniel, you're really being like Jesus. Amen? Because Daniel was a type and a shadow of Jesus. Amen? Amen. The spiritual versus the unspiritual or the mundane. Say mundane. How many of you know God's not boring? Now, picture this. Do you think the high school teachers are confounded if they see a student who's drugged up, who ditches class all the time and gets straight F's, you think they're confounded by that? No. But are they confounded when that druggie who ditches class, who's always getting F's, becomes a Christian and still gets F's, still cuts class, and still is always late because he's partying in the Holy Ghost at a conference all night. You think he's confounded by that? You think he's blown away? The teacher says, well, nothing different. He just found a different drug. No change in his life. He's still a failure. He still lacks diligence. He still doesn't seem to care about anything. Unimpressed. My goodness, your God should impress everyone. The lifestyle and the change in your life should be so impressive to all those people around you that they can't help to say, good God, what happened to you? 
That's called an opening. That's called testimony time. That's called the person who's pre-saved is about to be saved. That's called opportunity. Right? When you're the only happy one in your office, everyone hates the boss, everyone's complaining, everyone's cursing, and you're singing, you know, Jesus, Jesus. You know, and you got like a skip in your, in your walk, and you got the smile on your face, and you got there early, and you turned the coffee on for all the coworkers before they got there, you know, and you stay late to clean up the messes they made a little bit. You know, and your boss is so impressed with you that he puts you at the head and all your coworkers are angry now and say, you're only working here three weeks. Because <laughs> God's a God of promotion. Amen. And he wants to promote you, but it's based upon your diligence. It's not based upon your cuteness. It's not based upon your ability to flirt. Uh-oh. Stop flirting. Because you just might be flirting with the devil. <laughs> Amen. But if that student who was once a druggie, who was getting F's, who would cut class, would start honoring the teacher and start paying attention and participate in class with a joyful heart and is being diligent and excellent in his schoolwork, if I was the teacher, that would puzzle me. Wow, how did this kid turn around? How did this happen? Now, Daniel didn't confound King Nebuchadnezzar with his fanaticism. He did it with excellence. He got noticed through excellence. Brought in as a slave, made a leader. Sounds like your testimony. Amen? The word excellence in the Hebrew means preeminent. It means surpassing. It means exceedingly. It means extraordinary. It means extremely surpassing. It's interesting because it sounds like our God, because God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask, think of, dream of, or even imagine according to the power that works in you, the Holy Spirit, right? It sounds like God. It sounds like Jesus. Well, we're supposed to be like Jesus, not sort of like Jesus. Amen? Turn to your name and say, be like Jesus. Don't be like Mike. Be like Jesus. We're supposed to be above average. We're supposed to be above requirements. The very best possible excellence, it speaks of commitment and is a product of our diligence before God. We tend to think the spiritual things are this. Prayer, fasting, abstaining from defilement, preaching, prophesying, speaking in tongues, worshiping at church, etc. We tend to think that those are spiritual things. Are they spiritual things? Are those spiritual things? Okay. Then we think of the unspiritual things. Our secular jobs, our relationships, our health, studying, sports, whatever. And we separate the two. This is my spiritual life, and this is my unspiritual life. And that's how most people tend to view their Christian walk. I'm going fishing. That's my therapy, right? I'm going fishing. That's my non-spiritual thing to do, right? Wrong. That's a very flawed way to think. You could be pretty diligent in prayer, fasting, and try the best in keeping your eyes, your ears, and your mouth pure. You could be passionate about prophesying, speaking in tongues, worshiping, and even have so much zeal that you never, ever, ever miss a church service. But you can be sloppy and unmotivated in your job, in your relationships with your family and friends, your health, your studies, and everything else. You could be very sloppy. Say sloppy. Wow. We don't want to be sloppy. Sloppy is icky. We don't want sloppy. We want to be excellent. Amen. Daniel was excellent in everything. Yes, he was a man of prayer. Yet he was a good, faithful friend. He was getting promoted on his job. He was better in appearance and better in his health than the rest because he wouldn't partake of the rich foods of the king. He was smarter than the rest, and he was changing his nation. 
Daniel was living a fulfilled life. Amen? A fulfilled life. He wasn't just fulfilled in spirituality and the rest of his life going to hell. His whole life was fulfilled. A fulfilled heart sees sin as unnecessary. When you are fulfilled, you don't need any outside stimuli. When you are satisfied in God, you don't need beer. When you are satisfied in God, you don't need anything else but God. Because when you're satisfied, you're satisfied. You're not kind of satisfied. You're not almost satisfied. You're satisfied. Fully, 100% satisfied. Not lacking anything, not needing anything. But of course, we're humans and we want. We want. I want, I want, I want. As long as it's in God's will, that thing you want is okay. As long as the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. Because he'll satisfy you. Amen? How many of you want to live a satisfied life? Daniel was living this fulfilled life. Daniel's life was pure before God. Now you may think the only way you can please and praise God was through Bible study, prayer, fasting, and preaching maybe. Daniel thought that he could please and praise God in everything, not just in the religious obligations. In everything, in his relationships, in his health, in his studies, in his job, he could do it as a way of worshiping God, honoring God, putting God first, not to give God a bad name. Amen? Have you ever met someone that gave God a bad name? Listen, we see them all the time. You know, I was talking to someone a couple weeks ago, and they said, I, uh, I don't want to go to church. Too many hypocrites. R.W. Schambach responded to a person like that once. and said, well, where do you expect the hypocrites to be? <laughs> yeah, we're hypocrites when we first get saved until we get regenerated and renewed. Right? And then we come shining examples like a, like a fire, like that fire in Texas I was talking about, that the glow could be seen 60 miles away. Amen. Don't you want people to say, whoa, what's going on over there? I need to take a closer look and find you. But when they find you, they find Jesus. That's the point. That's the point, drawing all men to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, you might be more religious than Daniel, but Daniel was more biblical than you. Meditate on that. Now, because the Bible says, whether then what you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Right? Hey, youth, does that sound familiar? Young adults, does that sound familiar? Ignite 1031, right? Everything we do is to be done for the glory of God. Everything we do could be for the glory of God. Eating a meatball sandwich, you mean I do that for the glory of God? Absolutely. Amen. You go to Subway and you get one of those little disgusting meatball sandwiches. You know, something that an Italian is not allowed to even look at. <laughs> and you bring it to your desk or, or in the store and you sit down. And the first thing you do is you open it up and you say, Lord, I thank you for these disgusting meatballs. <laughs> but I'm not Italian, so it's okay. <laughs> so I ask you to bless my food. Because in this place, look around, it really needs to be blessed <laughs> and protected and remove anything that doesn't belong, especially things with six legs, out of these meatballs so they could be health and strength to my body in Jesus' name. Amen? You see, I just turned my disgusting meatball sandwich into an opportunity to glorify God so that weirdo at the next table is looking at me going, huh? Maybe I should pray over mine. No knock to Subway. It's a joke. Don't sue me. <laughs> wah, wah. It's a joke, okay? 
Eating a bagel can become something spiritual. Doing the dishes doesn't seem spiritual, but it can be for Christians. Right? Doing the dishes is a way of loving your spouse and demonstrating selflessness. Right? Doing your chores at home when your parents beg you, come on, clean your room. Your room is a mess. And I can relate because my room is always a mess. You know, it can be done for the glory of God. Everything we can do can be done for God's glory. Exercise don't seem spiritual, right? How many of you love to exercise? A loud amen? amen. I didn't think so. <laughs> but it should be for the Christian because we do all those things in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Everything we do is in fellowship with the Spirit of God. That's how the natural mundane becomes spiritual. When we choose to include God in our activity. Amen? And then you will so let your light shine in the midst of darkness by doing it. Amen? Hmm. As a child of God, do you believe that God smiles down on you? Yes or no? If so, when? When does God smile down upon you? When you're worshiping him? When you're praying passionately before him? When you're feeling dizzy because you've been on a water-only fast? God smiles down on you? It's really easy to think that, right? That God smiles down upon us when we're doing the spiritual things. Does God smile down upon us when we're doing the non-spiritual things? When you're doing more mundane, everyday, routine things like homework, taking a shower, being with less spiritual people than yourself, etc., many believe that God's face becomes dull. But that is not true. God smiles down on us when we're going through our responsibilities during the day. Therefore, we ought to take care of our responsibilities with diligence, excellence, and joy. You know, we've been taught some things through religion that if I sin, God's mad at me. God is not mad at us. God loves us. It, scripture says that God is patient with us, wanting all to come to repentance, that none would perish. He's patient with us. He would rather us be obedient. But you know what? There's times where we've all fallen. Has anyone here ever sinned? Raise your hand. My hand went up first. My hand went up first. I win, <laughs> right? But we know that when the Holy Spirit brings the conviction, sometimes you call it guilt. The Holy Spirit brings conviction so he can touch our heart to make a decision to get right with him. You know? But the devil turns that into guilt and unworthiness, and we sit back and we go, God doesn't love me. I'll never be anything in God. Stop believing the lies of the devil. You see, the devil's a liar, and he's been exposed. And so now you need to walk in your rightful authority, keeping him under your foot, keeping your foot on his neck. You know what happens when you step on somebody? Come here, let me demonstrate. Someone put your neck here. <laughs> when you put your foot on somebody's neck, you know what they can't do? They can't breathe. And you know what happens if they can't breathe? They can't speak. And if they can't speak, they can't lie to you anymore. <laughs> Keep your foot on the devil's neck. Amen? Amen? We're almost done. Another hour, we should be good. <laughs> I'm kidding. <clears throat> Everything we do should be spiritual. Not just doing things like taking communion or going to church. Everything we do should be spiritual. Everything should involve activity with the Holy Spirit. If you're in the shower, I love praying in tongues in the shower. Nobody can criticize or make fun of me. Nobody bothers me when I'm in the bathroom. Right? Does anyone bother you when you're... Oh, well, I don't want to know. So, you know, when you're riding a bicycle, when you're driving your car, it is perfect time to share those moments with God instead of just being purely natural. Supernatural people are not supposed to be merely natural. We're supposed to be supernatural in all areas of our life. Amen?
If you approach your life as being spiritual, you will do everything with diligence as well as excellence. There is something that's available to us as believers, and that's our inheritance. If we aren't aware of it, we won't walk in it. If we're not aware of the things that God has given us, God has blessed us, the the authority and the anointing to walk in that place, if we are not constantly acknowledging those things to ourselves, reminding ourselves who we are in Christ Jesus, we won't walk in it. We won't walk in it. So we need to be diligent. We need to be determined. We need to be people who do it on purpose in all your dealings with all the people and all the crazy people you run to in New York. You gotta learn to bite your lip. You need to show love even when you don't really feel so loving at the moment. Love is not an emotion. Love is not a feeling. Love is a decision to act like Jesus. How else could you possibly love your enemies? Only through Jesus. If we're aware of it, we will walk in it. Next week, or the next teaching, we're going to talk about the characteristics of an excellent spirit. Sound good? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a shout this morning. Did you learn anything this morning? Now, if you're